Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. So let's pray before we get started. Father God, we just uh, thank you for being able to be together today. We thank you for the, the rain and then the sunshine. We thank you for the food that grows from the ground uh, to feed us. Thank you, Father, that we live in freedom, that we can, we can gather and worship and we don't have to look over our shoulders. Um, you know, Lord, just fill us with love for our fellow man so that we're not judgmental against those who, who don't know you, nor against our brothers and sisters maybe who have, who have yet to really feel that call to get back into your word. Lord, there's a lot of traditions on this earth that, that, that you need to address. And I know you'll address them through teachers, through pastors, and so on when they're going to be. And Father, I just pray that what comes out of this place is truth and salt and light. And that that's what infects our hearts. But Lord, none of it's just to know. It's to do. It's to, to live our lives by. And Father, as we open the book of Jonah today, help us to see who this Jonah man is and help us to never want to be like Jonah. All right, in Yeshua's name, I pray this. All God's people said, Amen. In... Uh, Herman Melville's epic work, Moby Dick. We find a most poignant remark by one of the novel's characters named Father Mapple. And, and this remark, I believe, well defines what we are about to undertake today. Studying the unique, the divinely inspired book of Jonah. So Father Mapple says this, Shipmates, this book, he's referring to the book of Jonah, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. Yet what depths of the soul Jonah's deep sea line sounds. What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet. What a noble thing is that canticle in the fish's belly. How billow-like and boisterously grand. We feel the floods surging over us. We sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed, all the slime of the sea is all about us. But what is this lesson that the book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson. A lesson to us all, sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. The major theme and premise of Jonah is not only for laymen and leadership alike, it is also simple. A true prophet of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has been commanded by his God to go and preach to the people of a Gentile nation who, as it turns out, are utterly detestable and repugnant to the deepest recesses of the soul of this faithful man, the prophet Jonah. Nothing on earth, nothing could be more nauseating, repellent to Jonah than to have to do what God has just instructed him to do. God knew this in advance, of course, but for the sake of Jonah's generation and all generations of the future, God determined that Jonah was exactly who he wanted to take this oracle to the people of Nineveh. Now, Jonah had a knee-jerk but deeply felt 
averse reaction to God's order that is so very human, and therefore most of us ought to easily be able to identify with it. Yet at the same time, you know, it leaves us to wonder how such a so-called out person of Jonah's stature, of high spiritual quality and knowledge of God, could even entertain rebellion, if only for a moment, as a legitimate possibility, let alone dedicate himself to follow through with it, to the death, if that's where it led. So as we read the book of Jonah, picture Jonah as among the strongest will of humans. A man who sincerely loved God and was a sincere, devoted, long experienced, God appointed prophet. Yet, just as with us all, he suffered under the effects of a fallen nature that was bequeathed to us from our common ancestor, Adam. Open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1 and follow along with me, please. Jonah chapter 1. <clears throat> the word of Adonai came to Yonah, the son of Amittai. Set out for the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it that their wickedness has come to my attention. But Yonah, Jonah, in order to get away from Adonai, prepared to escape to Tarshish. He went down to Yafo, found a ship headed for Tarshish, paid the fare and went aboard, intending to travel with him to Tarshish and get away from Adonai. However, Adonai let loose over the sea a violent wind, which created a, such stormy conditions that the ship threatened to break into pieces. The sailors were frightened. Each cried out to his God. They threw the cargo overboard to make the ship easier for them to control. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down below into the hold where he lay fast asleep. The ship's captain found him and said to him, What do you mean by sleeping? Get up! Call on your God! Maybe the God will remember us and, and we won't die. Then they said to each other, Come, let's draw lots to find out who is to blame for this calamity. They drew lots. And Jonah was singled out. And they said to him, Tell us now, why has this calamity come upon us? What work do you do? Where are you from? What's your country? Which is your people? And he answered them, I am a Hebrew. I fear Adonai, the God of heaven, who made both the sea and the dry land. At this the men grew very afraid. And they said to him, What is this you've done? For the men knew he was trying to get away from Adonai since he told them. And they asked him, What should we do to you so the sea will calm for us? For the sea was getting rougher all the time. And pick me up, he told me, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will be calm for you because I know it's my fault that this terrible storm has come over you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard, trying to reach the shore. But they couldn't, because the sea kept growing wilder against them. Finally, they cried to Adonai, Please, Adonai, please, don't let us perish for causing the death of this man. Don't hold us to account for shedding innocent blood, because you, Adonai, have done what you saw fit. Then they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped raging. Seized with great fear of Adonai. They offered a sacrifice to Adonai and made vows. <clears throat> the first words of this book are usually just kind of casually read over without fully grasping what's being said. In Hebrew, it is Wei Yehid the Bar Yehoveh. 
or in English, the word of Jehovah came. Now first, nearly all Bible translations will say the word of the Lord came. This is patently and clearly incorrect. The word Lord does not appear there in the Hebrew. Rather, what appears is the tetragrammaton, that is, God's formal name, that in the vowelless original biblical Hebrew is expressed with the four consonant letters Yud, He, Vav, He. Now, second, because of a superstition that arose among the Jews against saying God's name, sometime around the era of Alexander the Great in the mid 4th century BC, those who copied and spoke the Hebrew scriptures substituted God's name by writing on the margins of the scroll that Hebrews should say Adonai or sometimes some other names, uh, titles, instead of pronouncing God's formal name as it was writ actually written. Saying God's name is actually commanded scores of times in, in the Scriptures. But what is also important for us to, to, to obtain is that especially in the period of the Old Testament, when even the Israelites fully accepted the notion of many gods and goddesses existing, even if mostly for the other nations than Israel, naming a god was of extreme importance so that a reader or a hearer might know exactly which God was being spoken of. And especially when we understand the name of the Canaanites' chief god, Baal, this was just actually a common Canaanite word that meant the Lord. That's why we can see why being very clear about the exact name of a god, even of the Hebrew god, must be spoken, or otherwise it's unclear which God was being addressed. Now third, and perhaps the most important, nearly universally when those first words of chapter 1 are read, we assume that the phrase, the Word of God, is referring to the speech, the words, the sentences that form the oracle that God is about to impart to His prophet. That's not correct. In English grammar and syntax, we need to capitalize the word, word. That is, the word is a proper noun. The word of God is a particular named manifestation of God just as is the Holy Spirit. Now this notion ought to be familiar to all Bible believers and especially familiar to followers of Yeshua. I'll, I'll quote the, I'm going to quote here the King James Version because its translation is the most known to believers around the world. In John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word. See, the Word was an actual spiritual essence of God that existed long before humanity was created. And it is this Word that came to Jonah as a living messenger of God the Father's command and oracle. The Word, as an actual specific manifestation of God, did not come uniquely to Jonah. Rather, we find this opening statement of whom exactly was to be credited for bringing the Father's oracle to a prophet in several of the writings of God's prophets, including Hosea and, and Joel. And as we discussed in the introduction to Jonah, because people in that era didn't have last names, then no person had an entirely unique name. 
Okay, the same name was often used by hundreds, probably thousands of people. So there were plenty of men named Jonah that were Israelites. How do we know which Jonah among all the other Jonahs this was? Because the identifier, son of Amittai, was added. That is, a man named Amittai was Jonah's father, and adding the name of a person's father more often than not narrowed down a person's identity to, to a single person. And especially because we find Jonah, son of Amittai, and another Bible book, the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, and historically we know that this Jonah also lived in the same era as the main character in the story of J Jonah, then we're, we're pretty certain as we can reasonably make it that this, is, this can only be the same person. Now, verse 2 then is really the opening line of the narrative story. Jonah is instructed by God through the Word to go to the Assyrian city of Nineveh and there to pronounce upon them an oracle of some sort. Nineveh is described as a great city, but great in what respect? Probably a better English translation for the Hebrew Gadol, as it is meant and used here, is important. Important rather than great. That is the important city of Nineveh. Now, Gadol carries many meanings, such as chief, large, leading, so on. So using the term important sort of en encompasses it all. Nineveh was not the capital of Assyria at this time. In fact, historically speaking, there is some uncertainty as to which city was indeed designated as the capital. That said, the king of Assyria spent a lot of his time in Nineveh, which was probably the largest, most influential city in Assyria. Now, Nineveh was often used in the Bible to represent all of Assyria. Not unlike in our day and time when New York City or Washington, D.C. Is, is, is often used, at least by foreign nations, as representative of the USA as a whole or as London is used as a representative of the UK as a whole, Moscow, Russia, and so on. The prophet Nahum speaks strongly against Nineveh, but really of Nineveh being representative of Assyria at large. In Nahum 1.1, this is a prophecy about Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshi. Adonai is a jealous and vengeful God. Adonai avenges. He knows how to be angry. Adonai takes vengeance on his foes and stores up wrath for his enemies. Adonai is slow to anger but great in power, and he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Adonai's path is the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Then we all go on with chapter 2 of Nahum, starting in verse 10. Plunder the silver. Plunder the gold. There's no end to the treasure weighed down with precious things. She is void, vacant. She's made bare. Hearts are melting. Knees are knocking. Every stomach is churning. Every face is drained of color. What has become of the lion's den? The cave where the young lions fed, where lion and lioness walked with their cubs, and no one made them afraid. The lion would tear up food for his cubs and strangle prey for his lionesses. He used to fill his caves with prey, his lairs with torn flesh. I am against you, says Adonai Zavod. Her chariots I'll send up in smoke. The sword will consume your lion cubs. I will destroy your prey from the earth, and your envoys' voices will be heard no more. And then the first verse of Nahum chapter 3, Woe to this city of blood, steeped in lies, full of prey, with no end to the plunder. So this is a characterization, a biblical characterization of how Nineveh was seen. Actually, how all of Assyria was seen. 
Now, most English translations in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, interpret the passage such that they say that the reason God is sending Jonah to Nineveh is due to their evil or to their wickedness. The reason is that the Hebrew word that is being translated is Ra. Now, Ra indeed can be properly translated to evil or wicked. However, that's only one of its several common uses. At other times, it can mean misery, it can mean calamity, it can mean destruction. It can simply mean trouble, as in somebody having or someplace having a serious problem. The issue is that there is nothing in Jonah that says that God meant to say that in his eyes Nineveh was evil. Now, for God, perhaps God saw this Gentile city as being in trouble. In other words, they have suffered a calamity of some sort. Or, and this is what I think it is, God meant to be a little bit ambiguous. Okay, that more or less meant that yes, Nineveh, Assyria, had been behaving wickedly, and now it is suffering much trouble for it. Again, there is no evidence, none, of a divine threat involved in this oracle. Just a message that God sees what's going on there. In fact, although we'll approach it again when we find Jonah finally arriving in Nineveh, one has to ask why the people of the Gentile nation of Assyria would even have any interest whatsoever in hearing from a foreigner, the Hebrew Jonah, and from his God. What do they care? What would provoke them to any action except to mock and scorn this unwelcome visitor? There wasn't even one of them. That is, they had to be receptive to Jonah's message for some reason. Otherwise, there was no hope for a change. That's what this was about. If it was that Nineveh was prospering, just like it was at this time for the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel, then the people would have assumed that their behavior was not only approved by the gods, but also that their abundance was a great reward for their behavior. That is, whatever wickedness was happening in God's eyes would not only seem not evil in their eyes, but actually good. See, what we know historically is that at the time of Jonah, Nineveh and then Assyria in general was at a pretty low point in their history. They had suffered earthquake, famine, terrible military losses. They had a couple of weak kings in a row. Do people who are neck deep in abundance and good fortune pay any attention to the predictions of doom? Don't think so. Do they pay any attention to someone saying they are behaving immorally and unethically? No. How about if that person saying it, let's make it even more, was a foreigner? See, giving any heed to any of this would be more than unlikely. Therefore, I believe that the way we ought to understand the meaning and intent of the term raw in this instance, and therefore the gist of God's message through Jonah to Nineveh, is that it serves to convey two things. First, that there is indeed wickedness in Nineveh, of which they seemed oblivious. And second, that it is this wicked behavior that has resulted in their serious troubles. Well, let's bring this to an application in our modern times. If you truly trust God, and especially if you're over 50 years old, then the blatant immorality and the degradation of our Western societies, and I'll focus primarily on the USA, is all the more evident. 
until 25 or 30 years ago, the USA was the envy of the world. It was the one nation on this planet that was irreplaceable. We had no real territorial ambitions. We had a military that was the most formidable. And all of this coupled to a financial system that drove the other world economies. If anything, there was jealousy by other nations towards the USA as opposed to disdain. America was thought to be a safe place, a fair, a just place, a place of abundance where disagreements on principles could be aired and debated without threat, without censoring. Fifty years ago, it was even more so. At that time, there was so little disagreement among Americans on what amounted to our shared sense of morality, and the source of it, by the way, that it was barely worth discussing. The definitions of right and wrong, good and evil, were vivid. They were agreed to, regardless of where in our nation one lived or to which political party or religious group one belonged to. Children could go to school, stay out until dark to play with no real threat by others to their safety. Teachers were given the authority to have discipline over their classrooms with the chronic disruptors being removed or even expelled. Television shows were inevitably about teaching important moral lessons. Anybody recall that? makes me sad when I think about it. Movies were sensitive to not showing overly provocative, let alone lurid, scenes, and instead just left much to the imagination. Our aspirations as a nation were for community well-being and happiness and a good moral future for all. The lack of personal responsibility was not tolerated. Those who were lazy were called lazy and often were shunned. Common sense made it rather easy to discern those unfortunates who truly needed it and were gratefully open to a hand up, as opposed to those perpetual malingerers who always wanted and felt entitled to a handout. Yes, America was not perfect. We had things such as racism that needed to be addressed. And it was addressed, based on the principle of racism being immoral and ungodly. Today all has changed. We live in a post-moral society. That is, a major segment of our population goes on the principle that if one accepts that there even remains such a thing as morality, that it can only be defined by what our, by what our civil laws say is legal. Whatever our lawmakers say is legal is therefore the defining source of what's moral. Others of the same segment say that paying attention to the concept of traditional morality is but a barrier to our personal individual happiness and liberty, and is also but a relic of a happily soon to be extinct Judeo Christian mindset and ought not to be a consideration to our lives and choices. This slow rolling progressive abandonment of a universal well-defined set of behavioral boundaries and rules called morals that has its source from outside the human sphere has run parallel to rampant and increasing lawlessness a disregard for the lives of the unborn, anarchy in our schools and on city streets, 
and a fall from the USA's former international preeminence on virtually every level. The separation between haves and have-nots among us has grown as large as a Grand Canyon. Hope has turned to hopelessness. Our music, our entertainment have across the board turned dark, perverted, despondent in its tone. Trust in our public institutions has evaporated. But perhaps the pinnacle of our immorality and loss of direction has finally arrived. The emergence of a belief in alternative and fluid genders and an attitude of anything goes regarding sex and sexual behavior and this as a sign of progress towards ultimate liberty and inclusiveness. See the first and chief physical characteristic that our and creator our creator instilled in humanity was gender, male and female. They were numbered as a total of two and only two. The exact characteristics of each, biologically, societally, were plain and well defined, so much so that our fundamental DNA, our innermost instincts, calls out which we shall be and are. Roles of each gender were laid out as the boundaries of various kinds of interaction between the two. However, within the past two decades, this most basic foundational essence and absolute truth of human characteristics has been challenged by self-styled elites and determined to be wrong. The chaos this is causing between those who accept and welcome this new definition of gender and gender roles versus those who deny it has resulted in extreme polarization of our population. And it is near to spilling over into an open violent conflict, and yet somehow the USA remains prosperous. We're still prosperous. Therefore, the general assumption among our population and our government is, well, what we're doing must be right. This situation is a perfect parallel to Nineveh. A few years prior to Jonah's time, and also to Ephraim Israel just a few years later. A perfect parallel. They were self-deceived. And so their wickedness was not seen by them as wicked, but rather as intelligent. It was innovative. It was good. With their prosperity and their strength as proof of their rightness. But then, as was inevitable, the other shoe fell. Their society began to crumble under the weight of their weak leaders and a general societal malaise caused by their immoral mindset and behaviors fell upon them. By Jonah's day, Nineveh was still reveling in their wickedness, but not about what it had finally led to in their economy and in their society in general. Clearly, they simply did not associate cause with effect. They could not see. It was their wickedness that was the cause for their downfall. See, this is without a doubt. And for those who have the eyes to see where we are in America and throughout the West today, will we learn the lesson of Nineveh? Or will we choose to ignore it and become a target of God's wrath? So, was this going to be the end of Assyria? Is that what God sent Jonah to Nineveh to announce? Well, at this point it might seem so. The story advances to tell us something else 
Verse 3 begins with the words, but Jonah rose up. So in response to God telling him in verse 2 to rise up, to kum in Hebrew, Jonah indeed rose up, kum, but it was to go in the opposite direction. It was going the opposite direction that God told him to go to Nineveh, which was to the east. So Jonah decided to flee west. And the place he chose is called Tarshish. Now, Tarshish has been the subject of much research over the centuries. There's still debate over whether it is the literal name of a real place or if it's an idiomatic expression that carried a meaning that had very little to do with the actual word. Often in Bibles and commentaries and, and, and some of the Targums, the Targum, that's the Tanakh that was translated into Arabic, the word sea, S-E-A, sea, is actually substituted for the Hebrew word Tarshish. Others say there were likely a number of places called Tarshish, and each time it designated where metals were obtained. Yet when we find it used in the Bible, and as it is used here in Jonah, it's difficult to see it as anything but expressing the name of an actual known place. The most likely candidate is in southern Spain, or indeed there was a Phoenician colony named Tartessus. In fact, an expression used in the Bible when, descri when describing distant places is from Tarshish to Sheba. Tarshish was invariably towards the west, Sheba to the east of, of Israel, because that's the perspective they're looking at things from, the location of Israel. However, it seems like Tarshish and Sheba were used to express the furthest extent of the known world, from the east to the west, at least to the Hebrew writers. Just like it's usual to express the east to the west extent of the USA as from New York to Los Angeles. It's the idea of it. We also use in our culture the idiomatic expression from here to Timbuktu to mean some non-specific but remote place that is far, far away. <laughs> I remind all, however, that Timbuktu is a real place. All right, it is in Western Africa, a nation called Mali that's existed for millennia. So I place my bet on Tishish being a real place in southern Spain, which, from the perspective of a Hebrew living in Middle Eastern Israel in that era, as being as far west as the earth goes before it comes to an end. Or perhaps it is as far to the west that anyone in the Middle East has any knowledge of. Now we must recall that still at this time all people believed that the earth was flat, with edges that could, for the careless adventurer, be a death trap, where you literally could fall off into nothingness. Now, this point one must ask. Was Jonah's theology such that he actually believed he would escape from God by traveling someplace else? Someplace far away? Well, since the universal belief among humans was that each of the many gods was bound to a specific territory, and when crossing the boundary, from one nation or territory to another, that God from your previous ter territory could not follow or had no power once crossing over that national boundary line. Could this have been Jonah's attempt not so, not so much to escape from the reality of God, but rather to distance himself from the area of his God's influence, as he saw it? Well, since he was a prophet, I find it unlikely that he believes such a thing. He knows full well he can't escape God's will. 
However, in the understanding of his era, it was probably that he believed that since God seemed to only give his revelation to his prophets when they were in Israelite territory, perhaps it was that he could escape to a place outside of Israel where God didn't reveal himself. But even more, why would Jonah determine to do this disobedient act in the first place? Well, our answer to Jonah's motivation for running away is found towards the end of the book. And we looked at it last week. We'll look at it again closer when we get there, but I'm just going to briefly tell you, just quote it to you from the last chapter of Jonah, Jonah 4, verse 2. He prayed to Adonai, Now, Adonai, didn't I say this would happen when I was still in my own country? That's why I tried to get away to Tarshish ahead of time. I knew you were a God who is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, and that you'd relent from inflicting punishment. That's why. In other words, Jonah was pretty certain that once he spoke God's actual oracle of warning, or perhaps of doom, or whatever it was about, to the people of Nineveh, they would take heed, they would repent of their behavior. His worry was that then God would turn around and let them off the hook, according to his compassion towards them. The mere thought of it, that God had let them off the hook, what well, disgusted Jonah? Disgusted him so thoroughly because he despised the Assyrians. He did not want God's love extended to them. He personally hated them so much that he was willing to risk God's ire upon him rather than being obedient. He just could not bring himself to do anything that in the end held even the possibility of Assyria receiving love and mercy from Israel's national God. So Jonah went to Joppa to get a ship that was headed towards Tarshish. Joppa or Yafo in the Hebrew dialect has gone through many name changes over the centuries, including one still in use today, Jaffa. Well, why choose to try to find a ship there? See, interestingly, his history shows us that Joppa was not in the possession of Israel at that time. Never had been, actually. Joppa was a foreign territory. So the people he'd meet, the crew of a ship that he hoped to hire, they weren't likely to be Israelites. They would recognize him. Nor would the crew he'd hire worship Yehovah, whom he was trying to escape from in the first place. For Jonah to arrive in Joppa might have already put him beyond God's chosen area of revelation. Therefore, Jonah wouldn't have to be confronted by God chastising him for not doing what he told him to do. So there in Joppa, indeed, he found a ship that traveled to Tarshish, and he hired it for the journey. Now, there's some discrepancy among scholars as to whether he was simply one paid passenger among several, or whether he hired the entire ship and was its only passenger. Certainly in the story, only the crew plus Jonah is mentioned, nothing else about passengers. And in that era, there was no differentiation between passenger ship and cargo ship. Ships carried passengers and cargo at the same time. One can only imagine the discomfort for the passengers as there were no rooms for them to stay or in shelter in. They just simply huddled together below decks surrounded by animals and casks and baskets and barrels of all kinds. That said, very likely Tarshish ships were of the larger, if not the largest, variety of ships. They were going to travel the furthest distance over the unpredictable Mediterranean of any ship. So naturally, they needed to be more sturdy and greater in size to carry as much cargo over that long journey as possible. I mean, a one-way trip took many weeks 
even if it was smooth sailing. Now, the final words of verse 3 leave no doubt as to Jonah's intention. We're told that he did this in order to get away from the presence of the Lord. Actually, in Hebrew it says to get away from the presence of Yehovah. Now, what we need to notice is that this is the only record in the entire Bible, Old and New Testaments, of any prophet of God directly disobeying God's call to him. That's it. Only with Jonah. So the story of Jonah is all the more extraordinary and unique, and something that we need to take far more seriously than just a colorful and fun children's story. Folks, for any of us to hear God's calling to serve Him in some specific way and then to ignore it, or to deliberately attempt to avoid it, will bring consequences that more often than not are pretty uncomfortable for us. Even more, Jonah teaches us that we should, should we finally tire of our rebellion due to our discomfort, and then finally do what we're told but with a very poor attitude about it, it brings no reward, brings no merit to us that otherwise could have been. Jonah was no biblical hero, remembered for his selfless service to the Father. The Father accomplished his goal of mercy to Nineveh despite the best efforts of Jonah to subvert it. Douglas Stewart puts it this way as concerns Jonah's reaction that was such a radical departure from all the other biblical prophets. It's a rather long excerpt, but it's powerful. It's very powerful in explaining the essence of Jonah's rebellion. And I think it's worth hearing. So just open up your ears for a minute. He says, But to refuse to preach the possibility of divine mercy to one's enemies, no matter how malicious they may be, is simply too narrow of a view of God's love. Jonah was a seasoned prophet, had plenty of experience in pro-Israelite, anti-foreigner preaching, and those sorts of assignments he presumably didn't mind. He understood correctly that the enemies of his people, enemies of Israel, were automatically the enemy of his God, Jehovah. That is, after all, the basic assumption of oracles against foreign nations in the prophetical books. What he did not understand, he did not want to believe, however, was the fact that God actually loved his, meaning God's, enemies. He, Jonah, should have been able to infer this important truth from the long history of God's mercy to Israel, but his view was just too narrow. Like most Israelites, he assumed that God automatically loved Israel because it was his own nation and that God would never think of Israel as an enemy. It fell to Jonah's contemporaries, Hosea and Amos, to preach to the people that their own nation, Israel, had become God's enemy, and that other nations than Israel could bear the Lord's name. For Jonah, on the other hand, foreigners deserved only hate, Israel only love. You know, in Christ's most famous speech that Christianity calls the Sermon on the Mount, he repeated God's sentiment about what our attitude ought to be even about those who are our legitimate enemies. Just a few sentences after making the mostly ignored statement about the Torah and the prophets remaining in force until the heavens and earth pass away, which by the way we do see actually happen in the book of Revelation, and his followers, as his followers, our continuing obligation to obey those commandments, lest we begin given a status of least in God's kingdom, he goes on to say the following, 
in Matthew 5, 43 to 48. He says, you have heard that our fathers were told, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Then you will become children of your Father in heaven. For he makes sunshine on good and bad people alike. He sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. What reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Why, even tax collectors can do that. And if you are friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? Even the Goyim, even the Gentiles do that. Therefore, be, per be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. As God's prophet for many years, Jonah should have innately understood this message that Yeshua would speak 800 years later, even if the average Israelite didn't. Jonah loved his neighbors, whom he considered those to be his fellow Israelites. But he hated his enemy, Assyria. Now, even though Assyria was a legitimate enemy of God and of Israel, Jonah nevertheless was to love them because God still loved them. How is Jonah to be judged as any different than anyone else in this fallen world, Hebrew or Gentile, if he was friendly? only towards those he loved. My goodness, what a poignant, personal message and profound lesson for us to take from the story of Jonah, should we take nothing else away from it. Well, in verse 4, the intensity of the story picks up. As we are told that God sent a great storm upon the sea, upon which Jonah's ship was traveling. And the Hebrew word used to describe the way that God sent the storm is tool. It means hurl with force. It doesn't mean merely to send or let loose, as the complete Jewish Bible frames it. It is a word that indicates something is done with an intention and purpose and violence. God's purpose was to thwart Jonah's attempt to flee. And to best understand why this story was so impactful, especially upon the ancients, and why God would do what He did in the way He did it, is to grasp that storms over the seas were and are completely out of human control. They are awesome in their appearance, frightening in their effect. Universally in ancient times and still to perhaps a slightly lesser degree in modern times, storms over the deep waters of our oceans and seas induce such wonderment, if not reverence, such that they give writers an incredible opportunity to spin their tails around storms at sea. Now, although Jonah's adventure was real or was not contrived, it presents the perfect format for God to make His point by means of inspiring an unknown writer to tell Jonah's story for the sake of posterity. You know, in ancient times, those who survived terror-filled ordeals, terror ordeals at sea felt that their God or gods had shown them great grace to save them. Their survival against all odds so impacted some who made it out alive that it changed their lives because they saw it as a sign of a higher calling. Josephus recalls how he was one of only 80 survivors of a sea storm out of a crew and passenger list of 600 souls. One of 80. He so believed that he was saved for a divine purpose that had changed the course of his life. We even find the same as it concerns the Apostle Paul. Lest we forget he was shipwrecked not once, not twice, but three times. And Paul confidently assumed that he survived because God would not allow him to die until his mission was fulfilled. 
So he kept on the path the Lord set him on with increased fervor and fearlessness. Now I suppose when we view it from a kind of a 30,000 foot panorama, we ought to see echoes of Jonah's saga and Paul's adventures. I mean, after all, Paul was also sent to the Gentiles, and I doubt that this trained rabbi had much use for Gentiles, considering Rome's iron grip upon his countrymen. Yet, he did not do what Jonah did. Instead, against what was likely his instincts, he obeyed his divine calling and threw every ounce of himself into his mission to spread the news that is said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, not just Israel, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, Gentile or Jew, believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, we'll stop here for today. And we'll resume Jonah chapter 1 next time. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.